I don't want to go too far with this thing because I know some of those instruments. But you come to me and tell me what you want to play. And if it works within our scheme of things, I will get the instrument. If you'll promise me you'll give an hour a day for the next year. They said you could master, a, you could learn a, a, an instrument in one year. But you got to give an hour a day to do it. You have to do it. Otherwise, you'll never get it. Uh, but anyways, Brother Tim's going to come preach at us. Now everybody come at me after church and say, hey, how about this? I want a Gibson Les Paul. No. <laughs> I always wanted to play the kazoo, but maybe I should set my sights a little higher. <laughs> maybe a platinum kazoo or something. Uh, if you could get to uh, Book of Jonah, that's what we'll be tonight. Brother Andrew, during his testimony this morning, he was talking about the things that you know God had done in, in the lives of pastor and then uh, in his... Uh, his father and just all the people that had led pastor to where he's at and, and, and all the people God had used. And, the, and uh, that kind of goes right in with uh, my message tonight. Um, there's a lot of things that have gone on in our lives that we're, we're just never aware of. Things that have passed and uh, things that will happen. And God has used a lot of people and done a lot of things in their lives and he's prepared a lot of things. And that's what we're going to be talking about, uh, preparing. Uh, I'm trying to get to Jonah myself. Obviously, I can't talk and turn pages at the same time. Just I should have picked a bigger book, I guess. Maybe Psalms, I could have found that one. Um, but then Pastor, he started preaching from, uh, well, not preaching from, but he, he, he referenced Jonah a couple times this morning. I'm thinking, man, get off Jonah. That's, you got this other 65 books to use. Leave that one alone. Uh, but, you know, uh, we're going to talk about things that God's prepared and things that he's done in our lives. And um, some of the examples are going to be used in tonight. They're, they're not, they're going to come across as somewhat negative. But what I want you, the overlying theme behind this whole message, what I want you to see is I want you to, to listen to what I'm saying. And I want you to seek God's mercy and his grace throughout these things. There's going to be things that God's going to use in our lives that, and he's going to prepare for us based off of our actions and the things that we do. And, and they may appear to be negative, and maybe they are. But even still, and amongst those things, God's grace and mercy can still be found. And that's, that's what I want to focus on. Um, just uh, going forward, I, I see the world's getting crazier. Me and Andrew were talking the other day. And, and, and he's a young man. He's got his whole life ahead of him. You know, it's not that he's not anxious for the rapture, but he still wants to experience some things down here, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I was the same way, and I think probably most of us were, the, the, a little bit older. When we're young, we want to experience the things that this world has to offer. We want to, you know, for, uh, for those that are single, they want to get married. They want to know what it's like to have a, a husband or a wife. Uh, for those that are married and don't have children yet, they want to know what it's like to have children. And there's nothing wrong with that. But then you got us that are a little bit older and we've done a lot of these things and we're just kind of beat up and banged up by the world. And we're just ready to like, okay, you know what, Lord, I'm, I've seen and I've been here for a while and I'm, I'm grateful for what you've given me, but now I am ready to come home. And that's kind of where I'm, I'm at. And when I, when I look at this thing, I'm thinking, man, we're going to need a lot of grace. We're going to need a lot of mercy to get through what, whatever, you know, is going to be coming our way. Uh, I look at the generations and things are just getting getting worse. Um, uh, transgenders and all that stuff, homosexuality, that was not a thing when I was a kid, and it wasn't that long ago. And, you know, in the 80s and the 90s, that wasn't, well, the 80s, but, I mean, that really wasn't a thing. But now it's prevalent in our society. Um, and there's just a lot of things that younger people have to deal with now that we never had to. But rest assured, God's still in control. And he is preparing things in our life. He's preparing things before we're aware of it. He's preparing things that have been in works for quite a while. Um, I look at how did a guy from Pittsburgh, a predominantly Catholic area, get to a church in Dayton and get saved at a little Southern Baptist church? Okay, there, there's a lot of things that had to happen. Now, maybe that doesn't sound too difficult, but when you, when you know my background and when you know some of the things I've gone through, there were some dots that needed to be connected, okay? And there were some things that uh, for a, a time would have prevented that because a key part of that was my wife. If I hadn't met her, um, 
You know, God could have used any means, but he chose to use her. And there were some things there for a while that would have interfered with that. So, you know, he put her in my life. And then before that, her parents and, and her grandparents. And, and all these things led together. And all these things that God had prepared throughout the years. And uh, that's just what I want to look at tonight. If you could, uh, we can stand. We'll read the first three verses of Jonah, chapter 1. And we'll bounce around just a little bit. It says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee from Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord. Brother Andrew, can you pray for us? Mind, wife, today that would have been a reason to prevent us from coming tonight. Uh, we're going to thank you that we all made it. Thank you for the singing. Thank you for the uh, choir practice. All of you who preceded this. Uh, Lord, set the, stage, set the stage in our minds for the service that we're going to have. Pray, Lord, that you be with Brother Tim. I know he's probably put many, many, many hours into this. And in addition to all the studies done for years, and the examples and illustrations we're very likely to hear. I pray that we would all listen and be attentive. Or to not let the distractions of this world prevent us from being able to pay attention in church, uh, where we're going to hear things that will be able to change our lives. I pray that, Lord, that you be with him tonight, be with his mouth, be with his mind, be with his reading. Uh, Lord, but most importantly, be with the receiving end of this. Amen. Lord, be with us, be with our hearts. Lord, help us not to be resistant if we find something that is contrary to the way we, we think or the way we act. So what we've seen here in those first three verses, that just kind of sets the stage. That, that's going to set up the rest of what we're going to talk about. So if you want to look at the text there in verse 17, chapter 1, this is where we'll start out. It says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to, sw to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So we're talking about what has God prepared in our lives. So we see here the first thing God prepared, as we will go through the book of Jonah here, is God prepared a great fish. And he prepared this great fish ultimately to bring Jonah back. Okay, he, didn't bring this, he didn't prepare this fish to, to, uh, to destroy him. He brought it to bring him back on the course. See, Jonah had strayed. And, and he had strayed out of disobedience. And we too will stray. Now you've got to realize the things that Jonah went through, his, the physical experiences he had, we're not going to replicate. But we have still gone through these things, okay? We have strayed, just like Jonah, okay? There are times when God said, go east and we go west. God says, go over dry land and we get on a boat and head out the other direction. There are times that we too have done that in our lives. So Jonah strayed out of disobedience, but we too will stray sometimes out of disobedience. Sometimes it's out of fear. Sometimes we're just ignorant. We're ignorant of the situation. We're ignorant of what's going on. Uh, and we stray for, uh, maybe we're under the wrong influences. I'm not talking about substances. I'm talking about maybe we're just listening to the wrong people. Um, in today's day and age, you can get on, you can listen to anybody, and everybody's got at least one opinion. Um, and, and, you know, well, their opinions are what they are. But uh, sometimes you can listen to the wrong ones, the wrong people. Uh, you need to vet your sources. That's why I li listen to very limited preaching. Essentially, this is, this is kind of my standard. If a pastor or a preacher doesn't get behind this pulpit, if he doesn't let somebody come in this, I usually don't listen to him. Now, there's some older guys, you know, Lester Roloff, and there's a few older ones. But generally speaking, today's, pre uh, priest, today's preachers, if he doesn't let them behind this pulpit, I'm not going to mess with them. Why? Because anyone he gets behind this pulpit is more than, will give me more than what I need. Okay, that, that's good enough for me. I don't have to go above and beyond that. The guys that are here... Okay, God's given us ample supply of preachers within this church, okay? And when he brings in Dr. Peacock, he brings in Brother Pilkington, he brings in um, Brother Reagan, uh, Brother Evans. I'll listen to them guys because, you know, we're all the same. I don't have to worry about that. That just takes one less thing off of me that I don't have to vet them beforehand. It's like he's already, he already knows where, where they're at. And if he's willing to put them behind this pulpit, then that's good enough for me. Um, but we stray a lot for the wrong reasons. Whatever you call it, for whatever reasoning you put behind it, we're still going to end up in a place where God doesn't want us. Okay, We're still going to be going somewhere He doesn't want us to be. Now we see God brought Jonah 
uh, to where he could use him. God didn't change his plans to fit where Jonah was at. He didn't change his course of action. He didn't try to keep up with Jonah. Okay, He, he brought Jonah back. Now, I've known people, and I I've, know I've, I've used this illustration before. I think it's been a little while. Um, but there was a guy I used to work with, and he was, again, a young guy. And I have nothing against young guys. Don't, I'm not trying to pick on them. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, again, he wanted to see much of the world. This guy was, okay, when I was his age, I really was into aviation. I liked airplanes. I thought they were cool. This guy is sick. Instead of, like, music on his MP3 player, he has, like, sounds of jet engines. I'm like, what a weirdo, man. Who wants to listen to I don't, now, I'll admit, okay, when they, when they fire those things up and I happen to be outside and I can hear one, it's pretty cool. I like it in person, okay? And, and yes, I do like the smell of jet fuel burning from the engine. Not, not when they're venting the tanks, that just stinks. But when they're actually running the engines, I like that smell. I know, I'm weird. There are certain aspects about airplanes I still think are pretty cool. But for the most part, it's just a means to an end now. I'm kind of over that. You know, I've been doing it for over 30 years now. It is what it is. Uh, it pays the bills, but it's really not my, my thing anymore. It's not, my, not where I used to be with it. But this, this particular kid, his bucket list basically consisted of a list of airports he wanted to fly into, a list of airplanes that he wanted to fly on. I'm thinking, man, it's just an airplane. You know, you start the engines and boom, it goes. You know, well, hopefully it don't go boom. But you know what I mean, it goes zoom. So the point being is, I mean, he had all these ideas and it all centered around airplanes and he wanted to know certain things and, and, and he, was, he wanted to go work at different jobs and at one point he was willing to take a job as a ramp rat. If you're not familiar with what a ramp rat is, it's not a derogatory term, it's basically just somebody that loads the baggage on the airplanes from the baggage loader up into the bellies. That's what we call them, it is what it is. Um, but he was willing to, to walk away from an engineer job to go become a baggage loader or a ramp rat because he wanted to work for a different company in a different city. And I said, wait, I said, did you ever stop and think for just a moment, and this guy was a Christian, I said, did you ever stop and think for just for a moment maybe you're right where God wants you? And then, as so many do, he hid behind the excuse of, well, I believe God is omnipotent, and I believe God is, you know, omniscient, and he's all-powerful, and he's all-knowing, and he's all-present, and I believe God can use me wherever I'm at. And I said, yeah, but the problem is you're not where God wants to use you. Maybe, maybe you're right where he, you need to be in his eyes, and you're, and you're running from him. See, he had this idea that, well, God will catch up to him, and that's not the way God works. Okay, he wants us to be in his plan, on his path, not tailing along hoping he can catch our coattails at some point and get our attention. That's not the way it works. Um, I can't remember if it was Brother Joe that mentioned it the other night or maybe if I heard it, um, maybe last weekend, but there was a comment made about the prodigal's father. Was that you who said that? Father? Prodigal's father? Might have been last week. Um, <laughs> the, anyway, it was, a, it, was a, it was a preacher that said it um, and, and he basically made the comment that um, the prodigal son's father didn't go chasing after him. Okay, he stayed at home. He did the things, he took care of the things, and he waited on the son to come back to him. You know, and that's what God does to us. Okay, he doesn't go chasing after us. He's right, and here's the important part, and here's the part that we miss. He's always right where we leave him. See, when the prodigal needed to go back home, he knew exactly where to go because that was home, and that's where his father would be, and he knew that. See, here's the thing. When we get away from God, we always know where he's going to be because he's right where we leave him. He doesn't leave us. Okay, we always push him off to the side. Um, but God can use anything to get us back. We see he used a great fish. Uh, he can use whatever it is within his arsenal. Uh, I believe God will use any of the 200-some perverted uh, uh, versions of the Bible to bring us back to his holy word, King James 16.11. I believe God will use a, a Southern Baptist church with a pastor that preaches from the King James, but studies from any and all of the other perverted versions. Uh, I believe he'll use that to show us how good uh, a doctrinally sound church really is. Uh, I believe God will use a church run by men, but with women at the head of every committee, and a pastor's wife who has more control and influence than the pastor to show us how important it is for a man to stand up and be the head that God appointed him to be. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're saying, man, it sounds like you have some very pointed examples there. It's not like you're speaking from experience. You're not just, just drawing a bow at adventure. Well, you would be correct. 
Okay, I have been in this situation. My wife was in this situation. And that's how I know that God can use those things to bring me, to bring us back to where we need to be. Okay, um, I've seen it happen. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely speaking from experience there. We see in this passage here that it, um, God has a reason. You know what? He could have called anybody else to go to Nineveh. You know, he could have called, he could have called some, surely he could have found somebody else that was more willing. But he had a purpose and a plan he had, that he had for sending Jonah. Now, unfortunately, when this book ends, it's really, you don't hear much more about Jonah. So this, this book ends, it's like, man, it doesn't look good for Jonah. It looks like it ends for angerness and, and bitterness for him. Um, but God sent him for a reason. You say, well, what was the reason? I don't know. Ask God when we get there. He, he, maybe he'll explain it to us if he's, if he's feeling uh, that we should know. But by the end of the first chapter, I do know these few things here. By the end of this first chapter, we see the sailors on this ship, and they realize just how long God's arm really is, just how far he can reach. Okay, we've seen those sailors that cried out to their small G God, as the Bible says. We've seen them turn and re recognize that when they realized who it was that was in their cargo hold and who he was and where he was from and the true God that he served and why he was running and going the direction, they realized real quick what they were up against. And they realized as, as hard as they rode and as, as, as mightily as they struggled to get back to sea or get back to shore, they could not prevail against God. So they, they realized that by the end of the first chapter, we have that. Pastor mentioned this morning, by the end of the second chapter, we get a type of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. By the end of the third chapter, the inhabitants of Nineveh receive a life-changing message, and God revealed himself to them. By the end of the book, Jonah's learned some lessons. Doesn't sound like he's done much with them, but he has learned some lessons. He, he, he found out, probably, if he didn't know who God was before, he found out much more about him. He found out exactly just like those sailors. He found out that he can't escape God, that he, he can't hide in the, in the hold of a ship out in the middle of the ocean. God's going to find him. Uh, he, he, God showed Jonah it's not his place to pick and choose who receives the message. You know what? It's not our place either. There's a lot of times, I admit, there's a lot, I have been guilty of this. I'm not proud of it, but I, am, I, I have been guilty. I'll look at somebody and be like, man, there's just no way they're going to want to receive the gospel. There's just no way that they would want to hear about Jesus Christ. There's no way that they would want that. And, and, but that's not for me to pick and choose. That's not for my decision to make. Um, God shows Jonah that he knows more about the people and their hearts that he created than Jonah ever will. See, Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. He didn't like the people, but he probably didn't think there was any point in it either. But God showed him that, no, look, I know these people, and I know if given the chance what they'll do. God shows Jonah that he giveth and he taketh away, and it's better just to praise God and bless his holy name than to sit there and criticize him and question him and argue and fight with him. So we forget that God has a reason, and too often we fuss or fume or, you know, we, we feel like God has put us in the wrong place and, and, and we're not supposed to be, we're not where we're supposed to be or maybe God has made a mistake. When I first got into the jail ministry, you talk about a fish out of water. I know that God wanted me in that, but I didn't know why. And I'm sitting there thinking, I'm like, I have not done the things that these men have done. I've never, ever once snorted, injected, smoked. However it is you induce drugs into your system, I have never once done that. I can count on this many fingers the number of times I ever drunk, uh, uh, drink, drove drunk, okay, twice. Um, so a lot of, the, I've never beat my wife, have I? No, see, she admits. Uh, she backs me up. I've never beat her. I've never done any of those things, okay? I've never had alimony support to run out on or child support or anything like that to run out on. So I've not done that. Uh, I've probably been guilty of jaywalking a few times, but they never caught me on that one. Um, and I've never gone fast enough over the speed limit where it's jail worthy. So I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, Lord, I don't know what you want me to tell these guys. I've not been where they're, I have not worn their striped pajamas. I don't know what they're going to, and then it occurred to me, and God showed me, like, look, you may not have done the things that they've done. You may not have gone some of the places they've gone. But what you have in common is that at one point, you both had the same eternal address. Okay? You were both headed for hell. Now, maybe some of those guys have changed, and, and now, now that I get down there and I preach to them, and, and they're, no, they're saved already. But I know there's a lot of lost guys 
I know there's a lot more lost guys that usually admit it. So what do I have in common with them? The fact that I was heading at one time, I was heading where they're heading now. And I can tell them what Jesus Christ did for me. See, I can tell them how he saved me and how he changed me and what he's done to me. So it appears that God actually knew what he was doing. Imagine that, putting me in a ministry where I could go down there and every now and then God's gracious and God's merciful and he, he gives us a couple souls and they, they get saved. Uh, and, and, you know, we get to be a part of that thing. Um, we knew when we started house shopping, we knew that God wanted us in Dayton. There was just too many things going on up here that, were, that, that God was pulling us to and too many things down in Wilmington that, that was repelling us. Uh, we tried to get a house down there. And for a lot of reasons, I'm really glad we didn't because, first of all, I don't know what we were thinking, but this place was right next to a hog farm. I, don't, I still, to this day, I don't know why we wanted to buy a house on a, in, a, in a plot next to a hog farm. We were young. That's all I can say. But that, for that and many more reasons, I'm glad God didn't allow that. But, you know, the funny thing is, less than a year and a half later, all those doors that were closed down there all of a sudden were no longer a problem up here. And he got us a house up here. So that was uh, late 99. So for the last over 24 years, I've been making that two-hour trip a day. Pray for me on that because I'd really like to drive a whole lot less and maybe get something a little bit closer, but that's another thing. Um, but that's where he has me. Again, he has me in that spot. He has me in that job. And, and that's what I just have to, I have to be content. I have to be happy that he has me there and not really question it. Just do what he's called me to do. Um, but, you know, the funny thing is I think of all the things we'd have missed out on if we'd have been an hour away from church. And then you know, I think, okay, Wednesday night services probably would have been out. Uh, a lot of Sunday night services. Uh, all the years with the VBS involvement there. A lot of the things we've done. But then it occurred to me, I probably wouldn't have just missed those. I probably wouldn't be going to church here. We wouldn't have been going to the church where we got saved at, maybe for a little bit. But we would have found a church down there, and chances are it would have been the wrong one. It would have been a, a doctrinally incorrect one. It would have been a vanilla church. It would have been a contemporary church, whatever the case may be, and would have been bringing our kids up in that filth. Okay, so I'm thinking, you know what, that two hours a day for the last 24 years, it's a small price to pay when I look and see what, what God has done on the other side of that thing. I mean... How can I complain about it? He's provided my, he's allowed me to have a set of tires go last for 90,000 miles. Now, granted, they were like baloney skins, and they, when they were ready to change, they, they, were, they were done, okay? But he kept me out of an accident, okay? He's, he's allowed me to have, uh, those, of you know, know, those of you that know us, we've never had brand new cars. I've only ever owned two of them in my life, and they're long since gone. So he's allowed uh, us to have cars, and the things that have broke, he's allowed me to be able to fix. I don't claim to be the greatest mechanic, but God's given me the talent to fix and the ability to fix what breaks. So he's taking care of us. Um, God will put us in places. He'll put us in ministries. He'll put us in jobs, associations, all kinds of situations. You know, the thing is, probably 99% of the time, we're never fully aware of what he's doing with us. He, we're never aware of what he's preparing us for or preparing with us or preparing for us. We're just not aware of what he's doing in the background. We think we might have an idea, but a lot of times we really don't. Um, I told you before I used to have a, a license to go run up and taxi airplanes. And it wasn't just like, okay, I'm going to jump in the airplane and go take it for a spin. No, if we were going to run an airplane, there was a specific reason to do it. We had, either we had completed some maintenance and we had a specific uh, check to perform, or, or whatever the case may be. Maybe we just had to run it for five minutes at idle so we can get everything spooled up and up to temp and check all the, you know, do all the servicing and check the fluids. Whatever the case may be, we had to have a reason for it. So uh, if, if I looked and, that, and you know, they gave me the, the uh, binder with all the work that had been performed and all the tests, I would make sure that I go, and, uh, go to the maintenance manual and pull up the appropriate tests, make sure the appropriate charts in there. I had to know the uh, barometer and and wind temperature and wind speed, all that stuff was necessary for me to be able to do the job properly. So I had to have all this situational knowledge. But see, following Jesus Christ is not like that. See, he requires us to follow him in faith. We don't always know what's next. We don't always know the reason for why what has happened in the past has happened. We don't have the type of knowledge that sometimes we would otherwise have in some of these secular things that we do, like running jet engines. Okay, we, There were certain things I had to know. Following Jesus Christ isn't like that. He says, 
my grace is sufficient. All you need to know is that I'm in control. You're not. You're my child. Follow me, and we'll get through this one way or another, and I'll get you where I want you to be. That requires faith. Um, <clears throat> let's look here in verse 6 of chapter 4. We'll look at the next thing that God prepared for Jonah. Chapter 4, verse 6, and it says, And the Lord prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah, that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. So we see here that he prepared a gourd to give Jonah relief. So God, and this is going to be an understatement, and I don't really know a better way to say it, uh, but God is merciful and gracious beyond measure. Okay, he gives us way more than we deserve, and he doesn't give us a lot of the things that we do deserve. Okay, right? That's the two definitions, and I'll, I'll touch on that in a minute. You see, Jonah, he ran the wrong direction, as we talked about. He grudgingly obeyed God. So he, he, he was more worried uh, that the Ninevites were going to live than the fact that they were on the brink of destruction. Okay, he was more upset that God was going to let them uh, live and save them from the destruction. Um, but yet God still showed him mercy. See, in spite of all this, God said, look, you're nowhere near where I want you to be. Your heart is all messed up right now. Your mind is in the wrong place but I'm still going to give you mercy. I'm still going to give you something. Not only did God have mercy on the inhabitants of Nineveh, but he had it on Jonah. You know, the funny thing is God's never really done with us. If you're in here today and you're saved, you know, you may get to a point where you get so deep in your sin, you get so mired, and you just, there's no, you just can't turn around, but you're still saved. There may be a point where he says, okay, you know what? The people that you're going to damage and the people that you're going to hurt, maybe it's best if I take you out now so you can't cause any more collateral damage. Still saved, but yet he's helped a few others along the way. But the bottom line is he's not done with us. Okay? No matter what we do, God will give us a way back. He'll, 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 let us, he'll still be willing to use us if we're willing to come back to him. Okay? Again, it has to, always has to be on his plan. It always has to be by his rules. Okay? We can never interject our own desires in there. Uh, God didn't have to send Jonah. He had every justification he needed to wipe Nineveh off the planet. You know, it talks about their wicked deeds. Uh, it, it, the Bible is fairly clear about, and I mean fairly clear, I mean, it doesn't say a lot, but what I'm saying is it talks about the wicked deeds and it talks about uh, a little bit about the Ninevites, and God could have wiped them off the, the face of the earth and nobody would have argued, nobody would have disagreed, and other than the Ninevites, probably no one would have even cared. You know, it really wouldn't have mattered much. Um, their actions and their deeds and their words did not deser deserve God's mercy, but yet God gave it to him anyway, just like us. A lot of the things we do, a lot of the things we say, a lot of the places we go do not deserve any, anything from God, but yet he gives it to us anyway. He gives us that mercy. He gives us that grace. Um, mercy is not getting what we deserve, and grace is getting what we don't deserve. Okay? That's, that, you know, that, that's kind of the crux of the thing here. He, he gave them grace by not giving them uh, destruction there. He gave mercy to, to them by, by saying, you know what, you, you deserve to be destroyed, but I'm going to give you a chance, and I'm going to be merciful, and I'm going to give you a shot at this. And then, yeah, he, he said, Jonah, he said, look, you really haven't earned this gourd. You kind of put yourself in this position here, but I'll be merciful. I'll give you a little bit of shade for a while. It dawned on me as I was going through this thing that this was also an opportunity for Jonah to repent when he presented this gourd. It says, the Bible, verse, uh, the verse says, God prepared the gourd to deliver him from his grief. And when I read that, it dawned on me, it's like, wait a minute. The Lord gave Jonah an opportunity to basically cool down. Just, just sit. Take, take a load off. Rest. Calm down. The Bible says, come, let us reason together. That's what he gave Jonah, an opportunity to come and reason with him. Come and talk to him. Work this thing out. Okay, Calmly talk about it. Get over your emotions. Get over your anger. Get over whatever it is that's got you so twisted up and knotted up and bunched up. And let's get beyond the emotional side of it and let's talk about this. Let's reason about this thing. Has God ever given you an opportunity like that? Has He ever given you a gourd? Uh, perhaps a, a juniper tree? You know, we, we talk about Elijah, and I've heard a lot of people say, well, he, you know, he'd stand up against the, the 400 prophets of Baal, but yet he ran from a woman. You know what, when, he, when God gave him that juniper tree and he took care of him, he, 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 that's what he needed. The guy was just wore out. It's funny, when you go through there, God doesn't rebuke him, but I've heard a lot of men rebuke him. Okay? When, when, when God put him there, he said, look, man, you're just, you're just wore out. 
you just need some rest. I'll take care of you, get you over here, and we'll, we'll hook you up. And I think God's done that for all of us at one point or another. Call it whatever you want, gourd, juniper tree, just a, a, a place where we could go and we could just get away from everything, distance ourselves from the situation, take a step back and, and, and converse with God, reason with Him. Um, the thing is, unlike or just like Jonah, we don't take advantage of that. God gives us these opportunities, uh, the, these, these areas, these times, these, these places, these islands, if you will, we can rest. We can, we can kind of catch our breath and think about these things and, and you know, get over the emotional portion of it. Uh, and sometimes we need those quiet places. Uh, those instances, we can just get away and slow down. We can, we can take the opportunity to pray and settle our minds and distance ourselves. But the thing is, we have to take advantage of that. You know, God can give us those things, just like he did with Jonah, but if we're not going to take advantage of it, then, then we're going to be in the same place that he is. We're going to be full of angerness, and we're going to be full of bitterness. See, he had so amply provided for Jonah, but yet Jonah ignored all of it. That's not, that's, that's, he wasn't even paying attention to what God was doing for him. He was more worried about what God wasn't doing for the people he thought should have been punished. Yet he wasn't looking to see how God was actually providing for him. You know what, it's, it's, it's funny, uh, you think about it, um, the Bible says, you know, God will chastise those who, uh, whom he loves, and it says, and, uh, God cared enough to chastise and bring Jonah back on track. He didn't have to. He could have just as easily sent a shark in place of a great fish, calls it a whale over in Matthew, but he could, he could, and there's any number of carnivorous sea creatures that could have swallowed up Jonah and, you know, turned him into fish poo, and, and he could have found somebody else to do his job. But he didn't. He cared enough to keep Jonah in the, in the game. Uh, he used Jonah in spite of his attitude. God gave him a people who listened to the message and repented. Now, by no means am I a, a, a great or even a good preacher, but I'll tell you what, most people I've talked to, they would love to have the turnout that Jonah got, the, the kind of reception that he got, Okay, and he didn't even put his heart into it. God gave him all of that. And he, he took it for granted. God gave him peace. He gave him rest. But none of this meant anything to him. He didn't, even, he didn't get his way, and, and he was mad. His poochy lip was out. He wasn't having none of it. Jonah put his thoughts and desires above God's. And Jonah thought he knew more and knew better than God, and that's the problem. See, a lot of us find ourselves in that situation, too. We think, we think we're smarter than God. We think that God needs a little bit of help because, well, I mean, after all, God's been around forever, and, you know, times are moving fast. You know, can God really keep up with, with you know, is, is, and that's what a lot of these churches are doing. You know, that's why they're going contemporary. That's why they're allowing a lot of the things because they're trying to keep up with the people. You don't have to keep up with the people. You just need to learn to get on, on track with God. And he'll, he'll keep you in pace with him. You just need to get there to begin with. And he'll provide that too. So God knew at that time what John, Jonah desired most. But unfortunately, Jonah's desire was self-centered and it was selfish. His geographic location was directly proportional to his spiritual depravity. And you say, what in the world did you just say? Look where he was. He was outside of the place where he could have been doing the most good. Okay? If he was a little closer to the action, a little closer to the city, if he was within that great city, like as the Bible calls it, where God was working in the hearts and minds of men, then his, too, his heart too may have been changed. Okay, his attitude would have been a one of gratitude rather than selfish desires. See, he was too far away from it. He, he was at too great a distance, and he wasn't, he wasn't close enough to see what God was doing. He couldn't see the smiles on those people's faces. He, couldn't see, he wasn't there when the king took his robe off and the king covered himself in sackcloth and, threw, and sat in a pile of ashes. Okay, he wasn't there when the king gave the order to say, look, all, all, all the people out here, all your herds, all your flocks, we're going to do what we know how to do to get a, get a hold of God's attention. Cover everybody in sackcloth. Don't eat. Don't drink. Don't even let your animals eat or drink. Cover them in sackcloth. We're going to make the animals repent if it were possible. They said, you know what? We're going to do everything we can to get a hold of God because we believe he sent this guy. And even though he don't want to be here, God used him. And he brought him here and he gave us a message. And now we've got two opportunities, turn or burn and they turned, and they did it the only way they knew how, and God accepted that. Sometimes God will give us the desires of our heart, and that's not always as good as it sounds. You need to be careful with that, because sometimes those desires reveal who we really are. So do your, your, do your desires always line up with God's? 
I wish I could say mine did. Okay, I really do. And I could say that, but I don't think it's appropriate to lie. So I really would rather not lie. But I do wish my, my uh, desires always aligned with God's. But sometimes I allow other things to get in the way and to cloud that and, and to, to, to change my desires. I have to, you know, and then God will deal with me on that thing. Then I have to change my desire and I have to realize, you know what? Maybe what I want just isn't the best thing at this point. Maybe what God wants for me, even though I don't understand it, and even though it seems to be contrary to what I would rather be doing, maybe I ought to just, you know, suck it up and just go his way and, and be grateful that he, he showed me something. Be grateful that he's willing to, to have a plan for me. Be grateful that he hasn't just cast me aside. And that's, what, that's, that's where it gets difficult. A lot of times we just have to, to, to muzzle our own desires and, and our own wants and our own wishes and say, you know what, those are my desires. But Lord, what I really want is for you to work in my life. What I really want is, is for your will to be my will and put our own off to the side. Now separate that thing. Okay, separate that, that fleshly desire and get it out of the way. Um, it's all just part of our daily struggle. It's all part of our battle. It's part of dying, dying daily. You know, we have to learn to do that. Let's look there in verse 7, chapter 4. It says, But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd that it withered. So we see here, God prepared a great fish to bring Jonah back. God prepared a gourd to give Jonah relief. We see here, God prepared a worm to remind Jonah what truly was important. So let me ask you something. We talked about the gourd. We're going to talk about it a little bit more. We applied the gourd to our lives, maybe some things that God has done in our life, maybe some opportunities God has given us, maybe some places that he has given us to give us a little bit of rest, a little bit of relief, maybe some things that he has given us. Now let me ask you, at the end of the day, was that gourd worth more than the souls of the Ninevites? See, your gourd, rather than a real physical gourd, it may come in, in different forms. Okay, the gourds that God gives us, it may come in the form of wealth, maybe possessions, power, prestige, positions, recognition, stature. But let me ask you something. At the end of the day, what does any of that mean to the lost? What does any of that mean to a brother and sister in Christ that is, that is down and out and they are hurting? What does your money mean to them? If you're so worried about your bank account, if you're so worried about how people esteem you, if you're so worried about the car that, that, that you're driving... What does that do for anybody else around you that's hurting, that's going through a rough time? What does that do for the lost out there? What the, for years when I drove that, when I had that new uh, F-150, and, you know, it was new, well, I bought it in 06, but, I mean, it was nice and new and clean for a while. Didn't do those guys down at jail one bit of good. Not like any of them stood at the windows and the bars, ooh, man, that's a nice truck out there. I think I'll get saved and I'll get me a truck like it. Never did anybody a bit of good. Now, I didn't esteem that thing higher than them, but all I'm saying is, that thing didn't do anything for them. So you've got to look at these things. When God gives you these things, you've got to put them in the pro proper perspective. <laughs> what do all the gourds of self-centeredness do for your neighbor, or your coworker, or your family member, or your friend if you don't use them for God's purpose? Look, he, he doesn't give us what he gives us just to consume it upon our own lust. He gives us what he gives us, whether it's our talents or whether it's uh, 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 material possessions. He gives us those things to turn back and use for him. What mattered most to the Ninevites were eight simple little words. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. They got a lot out of those eight words. Even though they were spoken without love and they were spoken grudgingly, the message mattered more than the man. Okay, the truth of those words overshadowed the attitude of the man that spoke them. See, what they really needed to hear were those eight words and they needed to believe them. And they did. They were about to get wiped out in a supernatural event. The only thing that mattered to them was getting right and repenting. We talked about that, and they did so. I mean, they, they, they did whatever they could, even their animals. We'll cover them in sackcloth. We we'll, won't let them eat. We won't let them drink. We'll all be in this thing together. And we're either we're all going to live or we're all going to die together, but we're going to do the best we know how to do. There was nothing that gourd could have done for them. They didn't care about Jonah's gourd. But see, that's all he cared about. Here is a man sent from God, and the people within the city that he was sent to minister to had, had, had more sense about him than he did. He was selfish. All he cared about was what God was going to do for him at that moment and why he was on a mission that he didn't want to be on. 
Don't let your gourd get in the way of someone else's walk or someone else's salvation. Don't let your gourd become a stumbling block for another Christian. You know, that's one of the things that makes me super nervous when I get up there that I'm going to say. No, I understand. You, you, you preach and sometimes you say things and, and, and maybe they come out differently than you had planned them on paper or in your head. But I am so concerned that I, I'm going to be a stumbling block and I don't want to be that. Um, I gotta, I gotta, it's enough just to keep me on the right track. I don't want to do something that's going to cause somebody else to fall off. Um, and that's, that's a huge concern, whether I'm behind the pulpit or whether I'm in Sunday school or whether I'm down there at the jail or whether I'm just sitting at my computer staring at spreadsheets and PDFs and bored out of my mind, I don't want to be a stumbling block to anybody else. Um, the gourd was given to Jonah for relief, but he misused what God had given him. Whatever your gourd is, God can take it away too, just like he did with Jonah. And I think, we, like I said, we've all kind of got the idea. We're talking about this gourd in the sense of it could be anything. It could be money. You know, if your gourd is money, if it's something that he's given you to, to, to give you a little bit of, a, a, of an assistance, to give you some help, give you some relief, and if you use it and misuse it for the, and, and use it for the wrong things, he can send a layoff or a job loss, take it right away from you. Maybe a market crash. If your gourd is prestige and stature, he can humiliate you. That's no big deal. I mean, everybody's got a camera. At some point or another, we all do something embarrassing, right? No, no big deal there. If your gourd is, is self, you know, if you're so vain, I was teasing Andrew about being vain earlier. He's not. I was just giving him a hard time. But you know what? If you're so vain and you spend so much time in front of the mirror and spend how much time you're, 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 you're doing your hair, and if, you're, you know, and if you look just right, I remember a guy I used to work with, uh, he was telling this story about his, he took his daughter somewhere, and they saw somebody famous, and, and she wanted to get her picture taken, and, and uh, he said, no, I need you on this side of me, because they were standing in front of a banner that advertised whatever it is he was selling. And she says, well, but this is my good side. See, if you're so concerned about your good side, because, I mean, that's what, I mean, do you walk around like this all the time? I mean, seriously. You know, it's just, that, that's vanity. That's vain. You know what? God can, he can, uh, he can send sickness. He can send disease. He can send accidents. He can, he can take your vain, your, 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 your vain attitude and, your, and, and however you think, however beautiful you think you are, he can disfigure you in a heartbeat. If that's what's more important to you, he can take that away. How about possessions? If your gourd is possessions, he can send thieves, he can send fires, natural disasters. We have earthquakes here in Ohio. We have tornadoes. If God wanted a hurricane to come this far inland, he could do it. It doesn't, it, he controls it all. Okay, and if you put that thing ahead of him, he'll give you some time, but sooner or later, he's going to say, you know what, that, that's become more important. That's become an idol. That's become a little G-God in your life, and we need to get that thing out of the way. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to take it out of your way because I love you. God can counter whatever it is you've got in life, whatever it is you've set up, whatever altar that you have set up in place of him, God can counter that thing. We see here that the gourd itself wasn't the problem. It was just a gourd that Job, uh, uh, God brought up. Jonah's love for it was. And we all know what the Bible says about that. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Uh, it says, while which some coveted after, they have erred from their faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So we see here that we're talking about people who have gone after, they, love, they just love money. And I've, I've heard, uh, heard a guy one time, he was reading from the New King James, and it says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And he said, do you really think it's all evil? I said, well, yeah, because that's what the Bible says. And this was you know, 20, over 20 years ago when I didn't really know as much about the King James. I still can't say I know that much about it now, but I knew a whole lot less back then, and I knew even then that this was the Word of God. And I said, well, that's what the Bible says. He said, well, that's what your Bible says, my Bible says. He had the wrong Bible, so he didn't want to admit that. See, the real Bible, the King James, says the, the love of money is the root of all evil. Men will murder for it. Men will, men will backstab. Men will lie. Men will cheat. They'll do anything for money. And I always find it, I always find it ironic and I find it humorous. People will, wars are fought over money. The gold standard. Men will die for it. Men will kill for it. Men will cheat and lie for it. And in heaven, it's completely useless. It's nothing but material to pave the roads with. It's nothing in heaven. 
And down here, men will strive for it their entire lives and waste whatever God has given them for what essentially is building material in heaven. Put it in those perspectives, and all of a sudden, things have a different light. You can care for them more than him or his people or his ministries, and he can remove them, or worse yet, he may let them remain in your life as a consuming desire. And I'm thinking that would be worse than him removing them because now all of a sudden it's like, like he's turning you over to that reprobate mind. He said, if that's what you love so much, if that's truly what you want, whether it's, it's money or power or whatever, any of those things that we talked about, if that's truly what you want in life, then fine, have at it. You're not of use to me anymore. You're still saved if you accepted Christ. You're still saved. What he's saying is you can't, I can't use you in this state because you're not caring about the things that I want you to care about. You're too concerned with those earthly things, those earthly goods, those earthly fortunes. If you're fortunate, he'll remove them from your life, and then maybe you'll get things in a proper perspective. Sometimes we need God to send and worms to get gourds out of our lives. You know, we may not like it at the time, but it's necessary, and it needs to happen. There was a lot of things that our parents did growing up, and a lot of things we do as parents. We have to, have to punish our children. We have to chastise them. We have to do things like that. The parents don't like it. The kids don't like it, but it's still necessary. It needs to happen. And the parents that truly love their kids will do what needs to be done to correct them and get them back and, and get them away from doing the things they shouldn't be doing. Here in verses, uh, let's finish out the chapter, verses 8 through 11. It says, And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted, and wished himself to die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? He said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd for which uh, thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein there are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? So we see here that the fourth thing that God prepared for Jonah was a vehement east wind to get his attention. He ne nothing else was working at this point. He needed to get his attention. And after he did, he got, got, he got Jonah's attention, and all that we see come through that thing after all he had been through, after all he had witnessed, after all God had done for him personally. Forget what God was doing with the Ninevites. That alone should have made Jonah rejoice. If he truly loved God, then he should have been rejoicing at the fact that there was over 120,000 people not going to hell that day. But see, that he didn't find no, no, uh, no peace in that. All he cared about was his own self, his own life, his own desires. And all we see here is anger and bitterness come through. Now, we don't want that vehement east wind to prevail upon us. But I'm telling you, and I just said it a minute ago, just as, this, just as God not taking that gourd out of your life, okay, and just turning you over to it, God not sending that, that east wind, that vehement east wind to prevail in our lives, and him turning his back on us would be even worse. Okay, we don't want God to turn our back on us. He was still helping Jonah here, even though Jonah didn't realize it. Again, we're talking about the underlying grace and mercy that God is showing here. And, and that gets lost a lot of times. I don't, I don't think a lot of people realize that. But he kept giving Jonah a chance. After, if he was willing to give it to the Ninevites, he was still willing to give it to Jonah. And the Ninevites were more than willing, once they realized what they were doing, they were, they were grasping the straw, doing anything they could to repent. But Jonah, however, just kept going down that same path of sin and anger, and getting further and further away from God. His heart was hardened, and he wasn't even trying to get, draw closer. He had, he had yet another chance to straighten out his heart. In the last words we read of Jonah, it says, um, God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Just angry. He's talking to God. He's talking to the creator of the universe. And he's just angry and bitter with him. Telling God that he has a right to be angry and bitter. Could you imagine that? He's correcting God. He's telling God, God, you don't know what you're talking about. I have the right to be angry because I want to be angry and I deem that that's, that's what I need to be at this moment. 
He had the, the audacity, the boldness to confront God and tell God, you are wrong, I am right, I'm angry, I'm right to be angry, and I'm going to remain angry. Now give me that gourd back. I added that last part. See, that vehement east wind, that could have been avoided if Jonah's heart was right to begin with. You can see the progression of Jonah's anger and bitterness. God just showed me this today. I hadn't noticed this before. Look over in verse uh, 4 of that same chapter, chapter 4, 4. It says, Then then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? So Jonah Jonah went out of the city. He didn't even reply. He just just did an about face, boom, went out, sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow so he might see what would become of the city. He didn't answer God. He didn't give him an answer at that point. He just turned around, marched out of the city, set himself up a little, little bit of shade there, and he sat there hoping to see that stinking place wiped off the face of the earth. And he didn't get his way. And then when he realized that he wasn't going to get his way, when that gourd that God had given him, and he did nothing for, when that worm came and ate that gourd and, and took away something that he had no, no, no vested interest in, he didn't have a dime in it. He didn't, put, he didn't do anything for that gourd. Yet he was angry, but he could care less about the Ninevites. And he told God that he had a right to be angry, for God took away his gourd. Took away something that he didn't do. God didn't even have to give him the gourd to begin with. But yet he felt he had a right to be angry. Now how many times have we done that in life? How many times have we looked at God and we've shaken our tiny little fist at him and said, God, I got a right to be angry. You did this and this in my life, and this is not where I wanted to be, and this is not where my plans were, and this is not what I wanted to be doing. This is not where I wanted to be. Uh, This is not my station in life that I had planned for myself, and you put me here. How many times have we done that sort of thing? Maybe not those words, but come on now. Be honest. You don't have to tell me, but think. Be honest with yourselves. We've all done that. We've gotten to a point where we've gotten fed up with God. We've accused him of not knowing whether we're, we're, where we should be angry or not. You say, yeah, I have a right to be angry, God. I don't like what you've done. Why did you take so-and-so from my life? Why do you let this person? I've been there. I've questioned God. I'm not proud of it. I'm not standing here and telling you. I'm telling you what was wrong then. I'm glad that God didn't give up on me. I'm glad that he showed me. You talk about... We, we, <laughs> talk about a newlywed couple married for four months excited that we're going to have a baby and two months later that baby dies and I read about it in the newspaper girls having babies and, and shoving them down the toilet in schools you tell me that didn't make me mad you tell me I didn't shake my little fist at God and say God what are you doing are you have somebody here that wants a child and you give it to that person didn't you know that they didn't want that child you think I haven't been there Oh, I've been there. And it took a while to get over it. By the grace of God, he got me through that thing. And you know what? When he got me through it, and when I finally got where God wanted me to be, when I finally got to the point where I wasn't angry and bitter no more, he gave us that one. And then a few years later, we were happy. We were content. We're thinking, God gave us, you gave, all we asked for was one. That's all we asked for. And then he gave us two more. Two more. One's not up here. But you know what? It took me getting right with God. It took me getting to the point where I wasn't angry and bitter with him. It took me getting to the point where I wasn't questioning him and telling him I had a right to be angry. I didn't have a right to be angry. And whatever God throws in my future or throws in my, my, my path in the future, I won't have a right to be angry then. I didn't have a right to be angry when I lost a real good job in 2008. I wasn't angry. I was a little scared, a little nervous. Had a baby on the way. Had all kinds of things. 2008 was a big year. A lot going on. Got to the end of that thing, and God provided. Amen. Does it look like I've missed a meal? Or, or you know, does it look like I've missed out on anything since then? Nah. God's taking care of us. We see here. Jonah didn't answer God in verse four. He just turned around. His hatred for those people consumed him to the point where he was so angry and he was so bitter at God for showing mercy unto whom he desired to show them. It's God's mercy. It's God's gift. It's God's grace. He can give it to whom he wants to give it to and as much as he sees fit. See, God sent that wind to get Jonah's attention, show him the importance of God's will. 
We read about Jonah and his anger and his bitterness. We read about the Ninevites. We read about their repentance. How about the neighboring nations? Did you ever stop and think about them? What, what happened to them? The Bible doesn't really say much, but what happened to them? Did, did maybe the Ninevites' repentance was out of testimony to the nations around them? Maybe. You know, maybe they saw something there that happened. Word travels. They didn't have the Internet, but we still know that word traveled. Okay, God, uh, uh, he, he put out the word when, when, when um, Joshua and, and when they started conquering the land. All the inhabitants of the land that were further inland and further away from the Jordan, they knew what was going on, okay? Without the Internet, they still had uh, information, and they still knew what was happening. So you can't tell me that these other neighboring nations didn't know what was going on. That was a testimony to them. Whether or not they did anything with it, I don't know. But God used that. He could certainly have used that for a testimony. How far and to what extent God used this event in the Bible, you know, it doesn't say much more about. It pretty much ends here. We can speculate, we can, put, we can put a positive spin on it, we can put a negative spin on it. But at the end of the matter, God gave these people a chance to turn from their sin. Jonah gave them the most basic form of the truth with no instruction as to how or the what. He didn't even, he didn't even care to tell them how to do it. He just spoke eight simple little words and probably didn't do it with a whole lot of heart, probably said it with a lot of vehemence in his voice, just probably through gritted teeth the whole time. He says, I'm doing this, God, I'm checking this box, but I don't like it. And you're not going to make me like it. I'm just going to do it. This is what you told me to do. You swallowed me by a whale. I don't want to be swallowed by anything else. I'll do it. But, man, you're not going to make me like it. Hmm. He had an opportunity to be part of a great revival of more than 120,000 people. But instead, he got a whale, a gourd, a worm, and a wind. What good did any of that do him? He could, have been part, he could have been sitting there rejoicing in that city with those people, with those inhabitants. He got four other items that could have all been avoided. He could have stopped at the whale, or better yet, the whale could have been avoided. Every single one of them, if it had just went the right direction to begin with. And that's us. So oftentimes we go the wrong direction, and there's no need for any of that to happen. If we just do what God wants us to do, if we just go the direction you say, well, I don't always know what God wants me to do. Maybe you don't know every single step of the way, but I'm telling you what, you do know when you're getting off the path. He makes that very clear. When you're starting to get away from where he wants you to go, he makes that very, very clear, and you know that. So what you need to do is say, whoa, whoa, whoa. we were good over here, and all of a sudden I sense something. We're not good anymore. Maybe I need to get back over here, because over here you didn't have a problem with me, but now all of a sudden... Over here, you're not liking where I'm going. So how about if I just get back in line and I'll keep going until you tell me to stop? God will use anything he wants to get our attention. It could be loss, it could be tragedy, it could be financial hardships, all the things I've talked about, bankruptcy, hard times, obstacles. But you know what? We always want to make it look like we always want to make it sound bad. Maybe he'll use a promotion, maybe a financial windfall. He might use ministry teaching Sunday school. Or, or cleaning up the church, or keeping the church van running, weeding the flower bed, maybe pastoring a church. God can use whatever it is he wants to use to get our attention. And he doesn't always have to get our attention for the wrong reasons. Maybe he wants to get our attention to say, look, you're going down the right path. You're right where I want you. Keep on going. Do what you're doing. I like it, and I'm going to just keep feeding you these little morsels along the way. Okay? I'll just keep giving them to you. His tools are largely dependent on our attitude. Are you willing and receptive? Then he may use a, a, a gentler, less drastic measure to get your attention. Are you angry, bitter, resistant to his calling? Are you reluctant to follow him? Then you may have a vehement east wind coming your way. You say, well, how would that manifest itself? I don't know. But I'd be willing to bet if you've got something going on in your life right now, Okay, and you know that you're going against God, and you know that you're doing something, you're involved in something God don't want you to be involved. You have a real good idea why, how that, that east wind will come and how it will manifest itself. You may not know exactly the time and the when and the where and all the, the details to the, to the minute, but you've got a real good idea. So I can't tell you that. God's not going to reveal that to me. He's going to deal with you on that. But you've got to be open and honest enough with yourself and with God to, to, to look for it. And to acknowledge it when you start to see, when you start feeling them winds blow, you know something's going on. Amen. You know it. You need to get back and you need to, you need to turn that thing around and get back uh, where you need to be. 
He knows your thoughts. He knows the intents of your heart. He knows exactly what has you all bound up and messed up and angry and knotted up. He knows all of that. Don't, don't, don't try and act like God doesn't know. He knows you better than you know yourself. We see here the book of Jonah it ends with the repentance of a heathen people rather than the repentance of a prophet of God. We see that the book ends with judgment withheld for a time from the Ninevites. We see it, it ends up with Jonah angry at God for sending him, angry at the Ninevites for even repenting and listening to him. Could you imagine that? A preacher angry at the people for listening to him? What a, what a, what a goober. I don't know what else to say. He's actually angry at the Ninevites because they listened to the words that he said and they did as he said and they repented and he's angry at them for it. And he's angry at God for taking his gourd. Man, what a mess. I mean, in a whole, whole scheme of things, and he's angry about a gourd? He's angry that God ain't killing these people? He's angry that they even listen to him? I don't know how much more you could be polar opposite of where a preacher should be at that point. I... I like I said, I'm not a good preacher. I'm not a great preacher. I'm but to me, those things should all be 180 degrees. He should be happy that, that the Ninevites were willing to repent. He never should have left that city. He should have been in there rejoicing with them. He should have been happy that God even chose him for that mission. The fish brought Jonah back physically and geographically, and he could have used it to bring him back spiritually if he had only responded the correct way. But see, Jonah didn't. He didn't want nothing to do with it. The gourd presented a temporary relief. Jonah wouldn't have needed it if he were even in the right place to begin with. What greater blessings were in store for Jonah had he stayed in Nineveh, ministering to the ones of God? Could you imagine, what would the Bible have to say? Now, I'm not questioning anything. I'm not saying that God should have made it. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying is if Jonah had went back and stayed, well, not even left, if it had stayed in the city to begin with, maybe God would have included that. Maybe there could have been more to this account. Or maybe chapter 4 would read a little bit differently if Jonah would have stayed and ministered to the people that God put before him. He missed out on some blessings there. While the worm took away what he had cared for most, it never would have grown and his heart was in the right. wouldn't have even needed the worm if his heart was right. The east wind got his attention, but it, the east wind never had to blow. See, what I'm saying is all these things that happened and all of them were avoidable. None of these things had to happen. They were all brought on by Jonah. But yet, God did them out of mercy and love for him. He did it. He gave him opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. Even the heathen people turned after one warning. Jonah didn't. He took a lot more than that. And by the end of the book, there's, there's, there's no indication that he, his heart changed or his mind changed. What have you held in such a point of importance that the worms have had to come and devour? What has God had to send worms in your life to get rid of? What, what kind of gourds that he's put in your life out of, out of mercy that you did not deserve? I can name a few that I know that he's, he's dealt with me on. He's given me a, thing, a few things, uh, a, a couple gourds that I didn't deserve. What kind of winds had to shake your foundation in order to get your attention? And then when all these things started happening, how did you respond to God? Did it, have to, did it take four things prepared for you? Or was one or two enough? Did God have to keep repeatedly trying to get your attention? Or did you, did you turn earlier and say, you know what? You know, I, younger in life, yeah, it probably took four. It probably took more than that for me in some things, maybe five or six or seven or eight. I don't know. But I know now that I try, when I see God working in my life, when I see him doing, telling me that I'm going down the wrong path, I try to get that thing turned around as quick as can. Because I just don't have as much time as I used to, and I don't have the desire to trace after those things anymore. It's like I'd rather be following God, even if it's going to make me miss out on something here. Because at the end of the day, I'm really not missing out. You know, um, I tell my kids all the time I'm boring. I don't really, a lot of the things that, you know, younger people want to do, I have no desire to do those things. I talked about that earlier. I'm good. God's been so gracious to me, and he's given me everything I've ever wanted. I think I drive my wife nuts because she wants to go travel a lot. Uh, you know, and I do, too, when I retire, if I retire, if I get to that age and get to that point in life. Yeah, I do, too. I'd like to go to the Grand Canyon. You said it's a big hole in the ground. Yeah, if God made it, it would be kind of cool. There's a lot of places. I'd like to go see some of those old uh, ghost towns out there in the, in the West, if there's any left. I don't know. Um, but other than that, I really don't have a lot of desire to do a lot of, of stuff. God's just been good. 
And, uh, and I don't mean that, uh, you know, just sound like, well, yeah, he's just been good. No, I mean, he, he's got me to a point where I'm content. I don't need anything else because he's been more than sufficient for me. Let's turn to John chapter 14. We've talked about a lot of things here that God has prepared. So I'm going to assume everybody in this crowd is saved. And if you're not, there's any number of people here that can help you with that. In John chapter 14, we're going to look at one more thing that God, Jesus, is preparing for us. Chapter 14, verse 1 and 2 says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. He's preparing a place for us. That's, that's pretty awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that. I, he's preparing a place for us that I can't even begin to imagine. Number one, he's preparing a place for us that I'm not going to have to maintain or cut grass or do anything like that. I'm not going to have to do anything with it. It's going to be perfect. He's preparing a place for us that I'm not going to have a mortgage on. He's preparing a place for us that he knows exactly what it'll be what we need it to be. In whatever form or shape that, that happens to be, and I, I can't even imagine, my little tiny finite mind cannot imagine the kind of place that Jesus Christ is preparing for me right now. But you know what I trust him? His words say he's doing it. It's good enough for me. I'm not going to question it. I know it'll be exactly what it, he wants it to be for me. What God prepares for you is entirely up to you. Whether he sends you a wind or whether he sends you a gourd, it's entirely dependent on how you act towards him and how you interact. Now, in a few minutes here, we're going to have an invitation. But if God's prepared a great fish to bring you back on track and you've never thanked him for it, that invitation would be a real good time to do it. See, Jonah never thanked him for that fish. It would be a good time to do that. If you have angerness and, and, and you're just bitter and it's all pent up inside and you've not repented and taken advantage of that gourd that God has given you for relief, the relief that he's given you, that respite, come to that invitation, that'd be a good time to do it. If he's God sent a worm to destroy that gourd and you cared more for the things of, of, of the, the things of God and you care more about that, that gourd and you cared more about uh, uh, things that you, you really had nothing invested in, you care more about that and God sent a worm to destroy it and you've never repented, now would be a good time to do it. If God sent an east wind your way to get your attention, what's it going to take? Just like the men in that boat, you can't prevail over. You can row as hard as you want. But just like the men we discussed back there in chapter 1, you are not going to prevail against God. You are not going to overcome him. You better learn real quick. He sends an east wind your way. He's doing it to get your attention. You need to react accordingly. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for just an opportunity to get up here for a few minutes, Lord, and the, the message you gave me, Lord, and the, the words you've put in this book, the accounts, the men, the things that you've uh, taken into account over history, Lord, and, and, and over the years that we can use an example now. I thank you, Lord, for that. I just pray it'll be um, to help to us here tonight, Lord. I love you, and I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I heard a preacher preach this message one time and he, he finished.